continuing our study in the book of Genesis. As you guys are turning there, I'm going to go, go, and go ahead and open us up with another word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we're not blind to how to operate in this world. Our faith is not blind. You've given us clear direction and instruction and righteousness through your word, Father God. And even me as a, as, as a leader of the flock, Father God, I don't know what I'm doing a lot of times. So I thank you that you've given us a roadmap that we can follow and trust that it is good manna if we are to partake of it. So, Lord, feed your sheep this evening. Feed them in the manner that you would have them to be fed. And may they be mightily encouraged. May they be fortified. And may they understand that you are the God who is ready to forgive the moment we turn, make an about face, confess our sins to you and repent. You are there. You are chasing us down, Father. So we thank you. We pray this in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Genesis chapter four. We are continuing our verse by verse study through the book of Genesis. And again, we're looking at the book of Genesis as the most important book in all of scripture. Now, again, that's not just because it's my favorite book. It's because it lays the foundations of our faith. And when you understand Genesis, it helps to illuminate the whole narrative of scripture. And the thing that illuminates the Old Testament is the light of Jesus Christ. You can find Jesus on every page of scripture. A lot of people think we are just New Testament Christians. No, the Bible says of itself that all scripture is, is inspired of God. And when they wrote that, the only thing around was the Old Testament. So it is inspired of God. And we believe that you can find Jesus on every single page of scripture. Now, last time we were in Genesis chapter four, we looked at the trial the verdict and the sentencing of Cain for what he did to his brother Abel. We looked at the way of Cain and what that means to us, to the false teachers, to the apostates. We looked at it in light of Jude verse 11 and how those apostates had walked in the way of Cain. Then we looked at the God who can forgive even the murderers, the God who can forgive even the murderers. Now, tonight, we're going to take a look at the intrinsic consequences of sin, meaning the consequences of sin that happen because it's sin, not necessarily because of a judgment falling upon us. The Bible presents the idea that sin has repercussions. It's a lot like throwing up a stone in a pond. There are ripples from a sin. So we're going to look at the intrinsic consequences of sin. Then we're going to look at a continued degradation of society from the moment of the fall. Or in other words, we're going to take a look at city life. We're going to see what city life is truly like. We're going to take a look at everything that the flesh can muster up leads to death. So those are the things we're going to look at. We're going to go from verse 16 to about verse 24. We stopped in verse 15. That was at the end of the judgment that was handed out to Cain. Now we're going to take a look at the fruit of Cain, the genealogy of Cain. So read with me in uh, Genesis chapter 4, verse 16. It says, Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And... <clears throat> And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad begot Mehujael, and Mehujael begot Methushael, and Methushael begot Lamech. Then Lamech took for himself two wives, and the name of one was Adah, and the name of the second was Zillah, and Adah bore Jabel. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of those who play the harp and the flute. And for Zillah, she bore Tubalcane, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. And the sister of Tubalcane was Namah. Then Lamech said unto his wives, Adah and Zillah, hear my voice. Wives of Lamech, listen to my speech. For I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech shall be avenged seventy-sevenfold, or seventy times sevenfold. 
I know this seems a bit redundant to go into the begots to begetten, but I believe that this is here for a very specific purpose, and it is here for us. Now, just to, again, understand some context, if you guys haven't been with us, within one generation of the fall of man, sin degrades mankind's soul to the point where they commit murder. Cain becomes cursed from that which gives him identity. The, the ability to sow seed into the ground and gain fruit is cut off from him because he has cut off the life of his brother. And a judgment is given to him in verse 12, where he is to be a vagabond and a fugitive for the rest of his life. He becomes marked so that the whole world would see his folly and his rebellion. Now, tonight we're going to look into the legacy and the heritage of Cain's genealogy. But the question it brings up is why? Why on earth? is Cain's genealogy included in scripture. Think about it. Every single one of Cain's genealogy and his offspring gets wiped out in the flood. They don't go past Genesis you know, six through eight. It, they're gonna die anyway. Why is that recorded for our knowledge? And, and, and notice here, it's different than the genealogy we'll see in Genesis 5. Genesis 5 includes a genealogy that includes dates and numbers of years that a person is until they actually had another offspring. And that offspring leads to the next offer, offspring. It'll say, this person lived this long, then gave birth to this person, and then he died when he was this old. So this genealogy has none of that. And we can re we could calculate the dates backwards from that genealogy leading up to the flood of Noah, and we can get an age of the earth. But Cain's genealogy is absent of that. So it's not there for dating the earth. It's not there because it's going to tell us what nation came from Cain. It almost seems arbitrary. It almost seems like it's included, like nonsensically. Yet it's still included. And I believe there's several reasons why it's included, but most importantly, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness so that the man of God can be thoroughly equipped for every good work. If the Holy Spirit saw fit to include this dead-end genealogy in scriptures, According to First Timothy or Second Timothy chapter three, we will find teaching. We will find instruction in righteousness. We will find conviction and correction. We will find the things that the inspired scriptures were meant to give to us within this text. So after receiving his sentencing, Cain leaves. Now notice in verse 13 through 14, Cain never repents of his sin, and he has a very me-focused response. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth, and it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. Listen, if you're talking in sentences that include that many I's and me's, something's wrong. That's not true repentance. He's more worried about his life that he still has than about what he did to, to Abel in order to end his life. That is not the mark of true repentance. It's the mark of selfishness, or better said, self-righteousness. And the Lord still ha has mercy upon him. And I believe because he wanted Cain to live out his life and give birth to his, a genealogy that would speak to us, that would show us what a life lived according to the flesh will breed. So that's one of the reasons why I believe we have this genealogy here. Now, after that, we see in verse 16, it says, then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Now, initially, when I had studied these scriptures, I actually had hope for Cain. I really did. And there's several reasons when I, uh, last time I studied through Genesis myself, I, I thought that Cain might have been redeemed. And, and, you know, I have several reasons as to that, but it shows you that I'm still a student of the word. I'm still learning and I'm still digging into scriptures and adjusting my perspectives. By the way, that's why you guys should be studying to show yourselves approved. Notice that verse says study to show yourselves, not Pastor Gabe or Pastor Maurice or Pastor Dennis or Pastor Caleb. No, you study to show yourselves. You're not even trying to study to show your favorite Bible commentator approved. 
if they're dead and gone, the Lord will have discussed whether they're approved or not. He will have found that out. We are to study the word of God to show ourselves approved. And let me say this in all clarity, though myself and all the pastors are up here teaching to you, we are still students. We're still students of the word of God. So I had originally hoped that Cain had redemption and I realized that, or I came to that conclusion for several reasons. First and foremost, several of his offspring have the name El, the name of God included in the names. It's almost as if God's name was being included in his genealogy. And I was like, yeah, maybe there was some realization and recognition that God had been merciful to Cain. And later on in his genealogy, there was repentance. I also noticed that he went back towards Eden and he settled east of Eden in the land of Nod. And and I interpreted that as maybe he went back there to be closer to God or where he once knew God dwelt, to be closer to the presence of the Lord. And not only that, His heritage, his descendants show great creativity. And, you know, creativity is something that is innate in us because we are made in the image of God. Now, we are not creators. We cannot create something from nothing that is reserved specifically to God. So if someone is saying you can speak wealth into your life and manifest something from nothing, no. That is a doctrine that aligns with Satan's doctrine that he said to Eve and said, you shall be like the most high. Be careful. Be careful. But we are creative beings, meaning we can take what God has put on this earth and reformat it, make it into something new. I mean, have you guys ever seen a potter work? It's beautiful. They put their hand, or even a painter. We have several paintings around here that are just stunning. I can't do that. And I'm a pretty good artist. You know what I mean? But I I can't do any of that. I saw this lady, by the way, and, and it saddens me because on Instagram, she has like maybe a couple hundred, a couple thousand followers. And yet these influencers have millions of followers and all they do is little videos of them doing stupid little dances like this. But there's this lady who only has a couple thousand followers and she has no use of her arms or legs. And she paints lifelike pictures of people's faces with her teeth. That's how creative we can be. Now we can use that creativity that is innate to us to either worship the Lord or to blaspheme the Lord. So the innate creativity that's there even isn't necessarily evidence that they were serving God. Now, me and Pastor Maurice were actually driving around one day and we we're having a discussion about this. And we, we kind of had differing opinions on this. And, you know, I'm always willing to like, oh, well, you know, I kind of think this, but you kind of think this. All right, well, you know, let's test it. And he said something that got me to start digging. And I love that. That's why I love having such awesome, you know, fellow pastors that sharpen me even. Yeah, Pop Dennis will come up after service sometimes and we'll talk about and he'll say something. I'm like, why didn't I think of that? You know what I mean? Like, man, like, oh, he drops gems like quickly. And then, you know, Pastor Maurice, Pastor Caleb going through the youth group. And I'm like, man, it's, if I talk like when I was a youth pastor like that, it would, be, it would have been way more effective. You know, uh, I love how each one of us can glean a perspective from the Lord and sharpen one another, even as pastors. But he said something to me that got me to start digging. He said the reason why he didn't think Cain was redeemed is because of the verse, uh, the first phrase in verse 16. Then Cain went out of the presence of the Lord, went away from the presence of the Lord. So, of course, knowing me, I love chasing rabbits. I love going on crazy tangents. So I started looking into how many times the the, the word went or the, the phrase went out from the presence of the Lord was actually used in Scripture. You could actually search in certain Bibles app the whole phrase in the Hebrew. So I've searched that exact phrase, went out from the presence of the Lord. Do you know it is only used three times in Scripture? Three times. It's used here in Genesis 4 to show that Cain, who did not accept his punishment, who did not accept accountability for his sin, and who did not repent, and went and went out from the face of the Lord, The other two times it's used is in Job chapter one and Job chapter two of Satan when he leaves the presence of the Lord and goes to attack Job. So even when the other phrases are used, that same phrase is used in the other places. It's not good. (laughs) There's no good indication of what that means. It's specifically used of Satan giving, uh, getting the go ahead to go attack Job, and he goes out from the presence of the Lord and went to torment Job. So that give, gave me a little bit of insight as to, okay, this is now the beginning trajectory of Cain, his legacy, and his offspring. 
So thanks, Pastor Maurice, for pointing that out to me, because boy, did that really reinterpret everything I was going to (laughs) teach this week. But I started digging. And so this phrase, it talks about rebellion. It talks about going into evil and going down a path of wickedness. You know, that immediately, by the way, they left the presence of the Lord, that Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. It reminded me of John chapter 13, verse 21. Now, again, this would be in Greek. It's the New Testament. It's not the exact phrase, but the sentiment is the same. John chapter 13, verse 21 says to us, and when Jesus said these things, he was troubled in his spirit and testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about what he spoke. Now, um, about what he spoke. Now, there was uh, leaning on Jesus, Jesus's bosom, one of the disciples who Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore mentioned to him and asked uh, who it was of whom he spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus's uh, chest, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he who I shall give a, piece, uh, give a piece of bread to when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the, uh, the son of Simon. And after the, uh, after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. And Jesus said unto him, what you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, Uh, because Judas had the money box that Jesus had said to him, go buy those things we need for the feast or that he should give some money to the poor. And having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately and it was night. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. The same sentiment of Judas, who his feet had been washed in the prior verses, Judas, who had shared in the communion because of the dipping of the bread and giving it to him. Satan enters his heart and the Lord says to him, what you're going to do, go do. And at that moment, Judas had a choice to make. And he went from the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Saints, let me say this to you guys in all clarity. When the Lord shines the light of truth and conviction into your life and confronts the path that you're going down, do not flee from him. It will lead you into some dark territory. We see where it led Judas, but more importantly, we're going to see where it led Cain. Now, as we look at this genealogy of Cain back in Genesis chapter 4, we're going to take a look at verse 16 through 17. Now, there's a lot of names, and in order to get the understanding of what these names mean, remember what we said about Hebrew names. They weren't just names that sounded cool. They were often given based upon the characteristic of the child or the circumstances surrounding his birth or what was going on in the land at that time. We'll see more of that when we get into Genesis chapter five. But we're gonna take a look at some of the meanings of these names so that we can uh, draw out some application for us. So it says that uh, Lot went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden and Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch. Now, it says he went to the land of Nod east of Eden. That, That word Nod means exile. He went into the land of exile, right? Now, I want you to notice he does not become a vagabond. He actually does the complete opposite. He builds a city. He does opposite of what the Lord told him was going to be his punishment for the rest of, the, of, the, of his life. Now, exile is a very interesting word there in the Hebrew, the, the land of Nod. And in the, the Hebrew root for that is the, is the Hebrew word nud, with N-O-O-D, not N-U-D-E, but N-O-O-D, Right? And it means to shake, to quiver, to waver, or to flutter. And you think about being exiled, it's someone who's constantly moving, right? But the root word means to be unsettled. In a lot of ways, it would indicate something like restless leg syndrome, right? You can't just get settled. And is that not the life of someone who is walking in rebellion to the Lord? in unsettledness in their spirit, where nothing satisfies the desires of their heart. You know, David even says that when he was in sin, it says that he could not get comfortable. He couldn't sleep. He couldn't do anything because he was steeped in his sin. And it wasn't until he experienced the Lord's forgiveness where his soul was settled. That is the nature of rebellion. 
You might think you're getting away with it, but the Holy Spirit will be there goading you the whole way. That was revealed to us in Saul of Tarsus's life. We thought he was comfortable going about in the book of Acts, killing Christians, consenting to the death of Stephen. However, when Jesus confronts him, he illuminates what was really going on in Saul of Tarsus's life, who would become the Apostle Paul. He says, why are you kicking against the goads? No one knew. But Saul knew, and the Lord knew. There was an uncomfortability. There was an exile in his heart. There was this, this, this unsettledness, this shaking, this quivering in his life, seeking after something to fulfill his soul. That is the nature of rebellion, saints. It's, if you've tasted of the Lord's mercy, sin and consistent rebellion will keep you wandering and it will keep you from finding comfort because comfort is found in a person, is it not? Amen. Amen. So having lost his purpose and identity in rebellion and his unsettledness of his soul, he begins to try to build something that will give him self-worth. And that's when he goes and settles, again, dwelt in the land of Nod, not being a vagabond, not doing what the Lord told him. And he ends up... Uh, bearing a child. And it says in verse 17, and Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch. Okay, we got to handle this right now. All right. The biggest thing that people will say regarding the original creation of Adam and Eve, and then it going on to be Cain and Abel, and then Cain killing Abel, and then Seth being born, is they'll say, well, it says that Cain had a wife and they bore an offspring. So who did Cain marry? As if it's something that you can't dispel by the simple text. Like, especially for the atheists, they'll be like, who did Cain marry? I was like, continue reading. Continue reading, it tells us. Unfortunately, it's an uncomfortable answer for us in today's society, but it is an answer nonetheless. So, who did Cain marry? Because all we hear about is Cain, Abel. And then Abel dies, right? So who did he marry? Well, let's dispel with the controversies. Chapter four, verse, uh, sorry, chapter five, verse four says that Adam and Eve had sons and daughters. Sons with an S. Daughters with an S, plural, that indicates many. Now, also, I believe that at original creation, the creation around them and how they were created as human beings, they were at peak conditions. They didn't have achy backs. They did not, you know, once they hit 40, start going blind in one eye. That's not what happened with them. They lived for a long period of time, which shows that the conditions amongst the creation initially were different than today and that their health was superior to ours. We've actually found that, according to paleontology, a lot of the bones that they find and dig up as fossils are thicker, denser, heavier, stronger than human bones today. They didn't deal with osteoporosis. They didn't deal with arthritis like that. And they're, they're healthy. They're built like tanks. So don't you think Adam and Eve being in peak conditions and living in a peak environment would be maybe hyper-fertile. And how many kids can you have in 900 years? <laughs> and not only that, let's just say the first 20 years, you end up having 20 kids. And then 20 years after that, those kids end up having 20 kids themselves, right? Now you start doing exponential multiplication. In a very short time, you can get a lot of people. You can get a lot of people. So we're only told the men, and according to Hebrew genealogies, typically it only cited the men, right, with Cain, Abel. It says many sons and daughters. So there could have been thousands of people at the time that Cain and Abel were maybe in their mid-30s. We don't know. And the women could have been born in between then. So hyper-fertile. And it says in chapter 4, verse 17, that Cain knew his wife in the land of Nod. It does not say he found her there. The word know there means to be intimate with someone, He was intimate with her, and they bore fruit, and they had their first child. He did not find her there. He knew her there. So our answer is it had to be one of his sisters. Ew, yuck, I know. Cain and and Seth had to marry one of their sisters. But before you get grossed out, they were kind of out of options. That's really all that was out there, right, was relatives, right? There's no commandment against it until the book of Leviticus. Now, there's the reason for that. 
Let me give you a quick, brief overview crash course on genetics, right? I know this is not a science class, but you know me, I invariably am gonna become a nerd at some point in time, all right? Quick lesson in genetics. I believe that initially Adam and Eve had to have genetic material that contained a broad span of variability and adaptability. In a sense, their genetic was not the genetic code was not only perfect, but it was filled with adaptation in order to create all of the variety of offspring that we see in the world. Even in this room, look around. Other than those who are related to one another, does any of us look like the other person? No. Unless we share some common heritage, like the Latinos or African Americans or Caucasian or whatever, if we share, share some common heritage, there might be some commonality in our hair color, eye color, our hair texture, skin color, whatever, but we don't all look the same. And in order for that amount of variability to be there, it means our ancestors had to have more genetic code, better genetic code, less corrupted genetic code. So I believe Adam and Eve, their gene pool was vast and it was mutation free. So that means within the first couple generations, there would be minor mutations, but not to the point where it's gonna cause a problem because their gene pool that them and their offsprings, even if they are brother and sister are so vast, you're not gonna have any mutations. Now, the way genetics works is the more you isolate a gene and begin to copy it over and over again, the more mutations that you get, and mutations are never beneficial, they're always corruptive. Always. Have you got, okay, um, little kids, you might not know this, but how many of us millennials and, and uh, Gen Xers know what a cassette tape is? You guys know what a cassette tape is? All right, how many of y'all in the 90s you used to listen to your favorite radio station, and when your song would start, you'd put a cassette tape in there, and you'd be like, boom, hit record, right? And you'd make your summer mixtape, right? And you put it in your car. And then the next summer or the next season, new songs would come out. You'd take that same old tape, you put it back in the cassette player, and you hit boom, record. What does it sound like after you do like four or five copies over it? <sighs> right? Nothing but static, all fuzz, right? The reason why is because you keep copying over the same tape. That's how our genetics works, right? The more you copy, the more degraded and the more mutations happen within that code that you have isolated. We see the same thing with dogs. I believe the original dogs may have looked like a big wolf or something. And within the wolf, you would have all the genetic material to make everything from a cane corso down to a chihuahua. But that is isolating certain parts of that genetic code in order to get your desired look, your desired bark, your desired hair color, everything you desire, you isolate by selective breeding. And we can trace back certain breeds to other breeds that came before it. You can, you know, that's what the, uh, the whole um, thing about making sure that your, your dog has his papers is you can trace back his heritage. Say that these two, you know, the, the, this, this lab came from this, you know, all, all of these other dogs that were, had more code and variability in, in the midst of them. Now, the problem with that selective breeding is once you get a chihuahua, you can't go backwards. <laughs> a chihuahua is never going to give birth to a wolf again, right? That's not going to happen. But that's how genetics works. When you isolate a trait or a code or something, it starts to degrade. But again, if Adam and Eve had a vast gene pool, then their offspring would have less chance of having an isolation of a gene and a copying of a gene that would lead to mutation. So again, this is not an issue in the generations that were close to creation. Uh, furthermore, the commandment to abstain from incestuous family relationships happens after isolation of people groups happened after the flood, after languages, after nations were set up, after geography became isolated, and the limiting of the gene pool became isolated to locality. That's when the command came. And not only that, the Lord gave the command to one nation that came from one family. And he said to them now, and you know, once he moves them out of Egypt and is gonna further isolate their bloodline in order to bring about the Messiah, he commands them now, you are not it's, uh, supposed to have intermarriage between family relationships. It has to be from you know, at least a certain amount of generations or a certain amount of people uh, removed. 
You know, it's interesting that God would give the command then when he's isolating a gene pool. It's almost as if our God understands genetics. Think about it. When he's isolating the gene pool after the flood, after the Tower of Babel and the separation of the nations via the languages, right? After the table of nations and where they all transport themselves to. After the geography of the earth is still being unsettled after the flood and and things are melting and filling in low places and creating seas of division. That's when the Lord says, you guys are now becoming isolated. And if you copy this isolated code, you will start having problems. But prior to that, When the genetic code was full and close to creation, it was not an issue. That shows that the God who designs us knows how we work. So even in the text where the Lord gives the command to abstain from incestuous relationships shows us that our God is the greatest scientist in the universe. So my opinion is that to fulfill the command that the Lord gave to Adam and Eve to go out and fill the whole world to be fruitful and multiply, they had to marry sisters. With the original complete genetic code still largely uncorrupted, there would be no or little biological mutations or issues. Understand? Hopefully that's as clear as mud. Now you have an answer to give to the skeptic that says, who did Cain marry? Be like, his sister, ew, gross, I know. Let me tell you about how our God knows genetics. And then feel free to rewind this tape for them and show it to them, right? Uh, we have to address that because that's, you know, the foolish things that the world puff themselves up with to say that they're wise, even, they always fall against Scripture, always. Okay, now we got that. Let's go into the genealogy of Cain. His firstborn son, as we see in verse 17, is named Enoch. Enoch means dedicated. It means actually almost like an inauguration or a commencement, a dedication, right? Now, the root word for Enoch, the first son of Cain, means to train, to be dedicated, to teach. It literally means teaching. And the the name Enoch means the culmination of all teaching. Once you have learned, you are now commemorated, almost like a graduation ceremony. So it's speaking of being educated, to learn, to teach. That, we think that might be a good thing, right? Well, there's another Enoch that's mentioned in Adam's genealogy leading to Noah. The issue is not whether God wants us teaching things. The issue is, what are we teaching? What are we teaching? So he names, you know, Cain has a first son and he names a city. Again, he's building a city, <laughs> which we was not supposed to do, and he names it teaching. He names it after his firstborn son. He builds a city in direct opposition, not only to Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, where they are to go in and fill the earth and be fruitful and multiply, but also in direct opposition to his judgment, which is in chapter 4, verse 12, to to become a vagabond. Instead, he builds a city, dedicates it to Enoch, to teaching. This, I don't know why, when I was studying it, immediately rang to me as the first university town, the first university city the city that is built around a college, right? Now we're going to be teaching things. You know, I know the Lord was teaching things to Adam and Eve, but we have greater knowledge here. And we, this city, this local place, is is going to start gathering information that we have all collected over our longer lifespans. This is the first university town. And by the way, it's also validated that idea that this is like the first place of learning. Uh, according to worldly wisdom, is validated by later on, you see in his genealogy, skills, arts, culture, industry coming forth out of this city. I believe that we are limited to a certain city here where Cain's offspring dwelt because we don't see that one person moved away. Cain builds the city in rebellion to God, starts teaching them, and they become their own city of men's wisdom. We see that metallurgy, farming of livestock for industry, music and arts all come from his offspring. And it's, but you know, the interesting thing to me is is I've witnessed a pattern in individuals' lives. Those who were once following the Lord, once walking according to his teachings, and either fall into sin or say they, they had a crisis of faith and fall away from the faith, almost always they head towards secular academia afterwards. Have you noticed that pattern? 
people who fall away and then all of a sudden they go out and get their doctorates of worldly philosophy and start using it to attack the scriptures they once followed? It's an interesting pattern, interesting phenomenon. But name after name of great men of faith that have fallen away, you will see they go down that path of secular academia. Now, again, learning, teaching, training, education is not intrinsically evil. We are told to study to show ourselves approved, are we not? We are told of the Lord. He says, learn of me, for I am humble and lowly of heart. I actually heard a, a lady say this week um, who who's, uh, attends uh, a, ca- a Catholic church, and she says she's starting, the older lady, uh, she said she's starting to dig into the word for herself, but she's always afraid to go in and dig into it because she doesn't know if she's going to come out with the right conclusions. And she says, and plus, I don't know if I have permission to dig into the word. And I said, I don't mean to speak ill of the Catholic church. I said, but anyone who tells you you don't have permission to dig into the word when the word itself gives you express permission to dig into the word, they're becoming a, bore, a barrier between you and God. The Bible tells us to study to show ourselves. Jesus says, come and learn of me. Jesus gave us all the permission we need. He gave us all the permission we need to come and learn of him. So the Lord's not against learning. He says, those who seek me, they will find me. I am not far from them, right? We remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, right? Or the Lord starts saying that the, the, the people who are going after worldly wisdom, they're going after false wisdom because the foolishness of God is wiser than men's wisdom. And God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He even challenges the church in Corinth and says, look at yourselves. Not many amongst you. He doesn't say not any. He says not many amongst you are wise. Not many are rich or strong or valuable to the world. So again, it's not saying that we should not learn, but it's making a delineation between learning worldly wisdom versus learning godly wisdom. The question remains is not, are we to learn? Because there's going to be another Enoch, another teacher, and we're going to talk about some of his teachings next week. There's going to be another teacher, a teacher of righteousness. And both of them, present before us two different worldly opposing views. The question is not whether we are to learn, it is what are you learning and who, are you, who is teaching you? And I believe that you know, that doesn't even exclude secular college. If you go to a secular college, but you understand that all knowledge comes from God, then everything is to be filtered by the word of God, then you can pursue education. But you have to have a foundation in this first. This is our firm foundation. It's not about the teaching. It's about who is teaching you and what are they teaching. So again, this first university town, we're going to see the culmination of it in a couple verses. But Enoch is born and he gets a city named after him. And Enoch, and again, this is a different Enoch than Adam's genealogy. We'll clarify later and we'll compare the two. Enoch was born uh, and unto Enoch was born Erad or Irad. And Irad begot Mahujael and Mahujael begot Methushelah, uh, Methushael and Methushael begot Lamech. Okay, now we have a rapid fire succession of names of individuals. So we're going to kind of go through them briefly. But I want you to notice the trajectory of the meanings of the names and keep in mind who it started with. It started with Cain, an image of someone who is self-righteous and thinks he can justify himself by the works of of his flesh, but the sin of his flesh leads to death. It leads to murder. It leads to injustice. So Irad, Irad is a very interesting name. His first son's name is Irad, and it means fleet or big assembly. It means a whole fleet of things. So again, this is further, I think, verification that we had a large population starting to grow in this city. A whole fleet of people, Irad, right? Now, the interesting thing to note about Irad's name is the root, it comes from a root word, which means wild ass. Now, again, that means donkey. All right, kiddos, that is not a curse word. And if we're going to go through the Bible verse by verse, the, the term ass is in there quite a lot, but it's always in reference to donkey. But a wild ass, something that is unbroken and already stubborn in its nature. Think about that. This whole fleet of people, and yet the root word of Irad speaks to the nature of the society that they're creating. The, creation, the, the, the nature of a donkey, an unbroken donkey at that. And we all know 
how stubborn donkeys can be. How unbreakable they can be if they've grown up in the wilderness only eating on their own. It is a hard task to break a donkey like that. But this term, wild ass, right, this rebellious term, I have found no better description of the nature of city life than Irad. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> it's pretty wild, and people do act like donkeys. If you don't believe me, try driving in Philadelphia or New York City. A lot of donkeys out there. <laughs> Try trying to have a, a, a civil conversation on the street about religion with someone. See the stubbornness that lays in their heart. So we're starting to see that within this city where they are starting to puff themselves up with teaching, the first result is stubbornness, obstinance, rebellion. By the way, that stubbornness, it speaks to us of a hardening of a heart the more desensitized you become to your own sin, the more firm you become in your own positions. And the more hard it is for the Lord to correct you. Not beyond him, just more difficult. So this is the fruit of worldly philosophies. Now we get this list again of, of Irad's uh, offspring. We get um, uh, Mahujael, right? Mahujael, and this was one of those words, one of those names that has the name of God included in it, Mahujael, right? Um, and it, it means to be smitten or struck by God, smitten by God, hit by God. By the way, it's not said in a very humble way. It's not said in a manner of the Lord has struck me and brought me low. It's accusatory. God has done this to me. God has struck me. As this city grows and breeds wild donkey behavior, God is blamed for the results? Think about that. This, the, the, the degradation of sin and rebellion upon this society, this city that is growing at the hand of Cain and his offspring, they said, we're going to teach ourselves our own worldly philosophies. They said, we will have a fleet of people here. And the moment those fleet of people with wild donkey behavior start biting at each other, they say, God has hurt me. It's almost like when people say, well, how come shootings are happening in schools and how much, how much depravity is creeping into our schools? Well, y'all kicked God out of schools a long time ago. Why are you blaming him for what happens when you tell him to leave? Same thing here in this society. I mean, think about that. And when, even when you speak to people who are of high education according to the world standards, one of their first rebuttals about God is if God is good, why does he allow evil to happen in this world? That's literally what's being said by the name of this person. They're blaming a God they don't even believe in. You think, you know, and these are the same people who will call Christians hypocrites, and they don't see the hypocrisy in their own logic. Well, why you're blaming a God you don't believe in? Will you first believe in God, and then I'll explain what he has suffering for in the life of a believer? Because right now, you won't be able to see it. The things of the spirit are foolishness to those who look through the eyes of the flesh. But God is being blamed for the results. Secondarily, we see the offspring of Mahujael is uh, Methushael. And this uh, word, this name means who is of God. And the of isn't really there. It's who is God. It's a questioning of who God is. More importantly, the word meth or math as it is in Hebrew means males, genetically men. It's speaking of the male person. You can interpret it two ways. They're dismissively asking in this name. Again, remember, these names represent what was going on in the culture at that time. This person is named who's God. But the correct interpretation should be man is God. Male, meth, el. God. Man is God. It's almost as if they're trying to answer their own question in a pun re regarding this name. Who is God? We are God. <coughs> oh, how they have bitten into the lie of Satan that you shall be like gods. Think about the degradation that happens in Romans chapter one. Although they knew God, Cain knew God, spoke to him quite a bit. They knew God. They were not grateful and they denied him. Then they gave themselves over to every wicked thing and they end up trading the truth of God or the word of God 
trading God for the image of, now a lot of people will say four-footed beasts and creatures and fowls of the air, but it starts with for the image of a man. They say, God, we know you exist, but we're not going to believe in you. We are going to be the own gods, or the gods of our own universe. Again, think about the, 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 this in the context of our modern universities. You can have a Christian, someone who is, who is professing of the faith, come out of youth group, graduate from college or graduate from high school, go to college and within their first year, they're saying these same philosophies that are found in these names. If God is good, why does he allow evil? No, man is their own God, humanism. Atheism and humanism found right here in these names and the degradation is in the same order that we find in Romans chapter one. Man is God. From fleeing the presence of, de of, uh, of the Lord, denying themselves repentance and degrading in the effects of sin, this is Cain's legacy. It's a legacy of worldly wisdom, worldly philosophy, philosophy atheism, rebellion, stubbornness. Verse 18, now we kind of get to a, a man named Lamech. And Lamech, again, there's another person named Lamech in Adam's genealogy, not the same guy, another guy named Lamech. But this is, uh, this is Cain's offspring named Lamech. And we get a lot more insight into him, into his family, and into the surroundings of his life. The other ones were very rapid fire. So we had to have to look into the names of those people. But we're going to look into the names. But it gives us some insight and key details about him and about his children. And, and, and that last name uh, on, on Cain's genealogy, the last male name on Cain's genealogy, I think bookends the whole legacy of Cain. Lamech. Interestingly enough, this name can be translated one of two ways. If you take Hebrew that has been influenced by Arabic cultures and uh, Arabic language itself, Lamech means powerful. In Arabic, Lamech means powerful. If you go to ancient Hebrew and you take the root words, le means two words or forward motion. Muk as a root word means to be low, to be depressed, to be humiliated. Lamech means to fall into despair. Think about that. Of the secular realm, of the Arabic realm, they're saying, no, 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 Lamech means powerful. But from the words of God from the Hebrew language, it means despairing. There is a difference between how man looks at himself and how God looks at, him, at man. We see that in the letter to the church of the Laodiceans in Revelation chapter 3, do we not? The Laodiceans, they say of themselves, we are rich, we are wealthy, we have need of nothing. But the Lord says of them, you are wretched, you are naked, you are blind, and you are poor. They see themselves in one light, self-sufficient. But the Lord says, your self-sufficiency is insufficiency before a holy God. So here we see two different names, and you'll see, you'll notice in, in depending on what uh, Bible uh, commentary you look at, they'll either lean towards the more Arabic understanding and say it means powerful, but if you go to the actual root two words of Hebrew, it means to tend towards depression, to tend towards despair, humiliation. It's a difference between how man sees himself versus how God sees himself. And we're going to see how Lamech sees himself. He sees himself as pretty haughty, as pretty high-minded. Now, he is, by the way, taking the idea of the church in Laodicea and how they see themselves. This guy has, has a huge heritage. This Lamech guy represents the peak of the city of Enoch that was started by Cain, the peak of human civilization and society. How, how do we know this? One, he takes himself two wives. Everyone else just has one wife. He takes himself two wives. Now, there's never a command in the Old Testament to only take one wife, but there is a pattern that started in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And Moses understood that pattern when he was compiling the book of Genesis. And he says, for this reason, a man and a wife, the wife shall leave her father and mother and cleave unto her husband. 
one and one. The pattern that we see in Genesis chapter one and chapter two, one and one, one man, one woman. God expresses a pattern and the pattern tells us what pleases him. Think about what Abel did when he presented the offering to the Lord. He slaughtered an animal. Where did he get that idea from? We say it came from the pattern that God himself demonstrated in Genesis chapter three, when he covered Adam and Eve with the skins of a living animal. He, something had to die to cover them. And the pattern taught Abel, that is how you approach God. So the pattern is established in Genesis chapter one and two, that, it is, that marriage is a covenant between one man and one woman. If God shows you a pattern, does he really have to give you a commandment? Does he? I mean, think about it. If God paints a picture on the wall, do you need it also in writing? No. He paints the picture, and the picture should be enough. And yet here this man takes himself two wives. And not just any wives. The word Ada, the, the name of the first woman that he takes, her name means ornament or ornamental or to be adorned. So she was a lady who had all the nicest fashions, right? She had the Gucci boots. She had the baby fat jeans. You know what I mean? She, she had everything, right? She was the fashion, fashionista of the time. She was adorned and ornamented. Zilla, it means shade or covering, but it speaks in the term of beautiful hair, as if she had the most glorious hair of all the women, flowing in the wind eternally like Galadriel when she's trying, getting tempted by the ring, right? Her hair just always, like, like there's always a fan near her or something, and she looks, and it's Vidal Sassoon going around her head, right? He picks the most beautiful, the ones with the most beautiful hair and the most beautiful clothing. So he takes two wives, and he tries to make himself look better than everyone else by the wives he chooses for himself. Lamech, by the way, means despairing. What is he trying to cover? When people try to adorn themselves from the outside to make themselves seem powerful, like the world of the rich and famous, they're often, often trying to cover a despairing heart. They're trying to cover a despairing heart. Now they have a bunch of kids, and we're going to go through these in rapid fire succession. Jabal, uh, Jabal, sorry, Jabal means, um, means uh, sorry, Jabal, sorry, means river or stream. First son, right? And, it, and it, it, he ends up having a job of being the first to actually bring the business of livestock, the industry of breeding cattle. It's not just someone who had, uh, you know, uh, a sheep or a flock. We saw Abel had that first. But this indicates that this is now a business. So he's the father of these people who go out, live in the tents. They're, he's the, the first farmer, the first cowboy, you could say. The first animal wrangler. And he does so in an industrial manner, in something that could be rep reproduced. Again, think about this, this, the progression of this city. They got to feed all these folks. They got to feed all of them. And so they're having an industry of farming. Jubal, it says of him that he was the music instructor. Now, he is not the inventor of music. That's not what's said there. He's the one who instructs people not only how to make certain instruments, but how to utilize certain instruments. And his name is similar to Jabel, but it's, it's a different uh, variation of that root word. And while Jabel means river or stream, Jubal means a damp country or a fertile land. It's almost like where the river would actually go into the land and make a delta. And, and the indication there is that brook, that river, that stream that feeds in would often start trickling down in waterfalls and make that beautiful sound of the murmuring of water. It also is the root word where we get jubilee from, the sound of, of, of worship, the sound of celebration. So we got a guy who's a farmer, pretty successful. We got another guy who's a musician, arts, entertainment, culture. Then one of the other children, that's from the, from the offspring of Zilla, his other wife, uh, his, and by the way, this is the last named male in Cain's genealogy, and he's named after Cain. So use this as a bookend. We have Cain. Tubal Cain means brought forth from Cain or brought of Cain. Literally, the root word for Tubal means to plant and to reap fruit. Fruit of Cain. What did Cain mean? Possession by works. Tubal Cain literally means 
fruit of works. What do we see? The fruit of works. By the way, Nama, his daughter, ends up being lovely. That's her name. Nama means loveliness or, or pleasingness, right? A couple notes in wrapping this idea up. The, the scriptures clearly state, first and foremost, that industry, arts, culture, metallurgy are all early in civilization. They're all antediluvian, meaning they happened before the flood. Every other evolutionary philosophy says that man ascended to the Bronze Age and to the Iron Age. The Bible teaches the complete opposite. A couple generations after the fall of man, and you have arts and culture, you have industrialized farming, you have livestock, you have metallurgy, including iron. So what do we do with that? Let God be true and every man be a liar. Now, we don't just take that blindly. The Lord says to us, and, or the word says to us in Hebrews, that faith is the evidence of things hoped for and the substance of things not yet seen. So there is evidence and substance. And did you know, you won't see this on the front of National Geographic, but when we get to the flood, I will show you guys pictures of lumps of coal that they have cracked open and found jewelry inside of. Veins of coal that they have split open and found ornamental instruments made of metal found in the middle of. Now, according to the evolutionists, those lumps of coal were made over millions and millions of years. How on earth do you get an iron cup in the middle of a lump of coal? Not only that, they find you, you, uh, uh, kitchen utensils made of certain metals next to fossils that are supposed to be billions of years old. How do you do that? Do you dig, throw it down there, fill in the hole, and hopefully some evolutionary scientist digs it up in a couple million years? How do you do that? Unless you actually take the biblical approach that says, no, men were smarter and we've degraded. Yes, our technology has become more advanced, but every time we have a technological advancement, we use it for evil. People are saying, hey, this power, this nuclear power, right, it could light up a whole city and it could pretty much be clean energy. And then some guy steps in the room and is like, yeah, can we blow someone up with it? It's like, kick that guy out. Why is it that that guy's always here? This, this powder that we could ignite, you know, it could show, it could show light and it could be used as, as a signal for, for uh, boats at sea, you know, like a flare or something like that. And the same guy comes in, hey, can we shoot stuff with it? Oh, man, why does this guy keep getting entry into the room? Every technological advancement, we find a way to use it to the worst of our imaginations. Phones that can give you the access to the best commentaries on the Bible that you can learn of. Apps like Blue Letter Bible app, apps like khouse.org, even on YouTube looking at videos from other pastors. And yet the same thing can be used to spill hate message against brothers, can be used to access pornographic material can be used to, to propagate lies of the enemy. Yes, we've become more technologically advanced, but don't think we haven't become more wicked. So we see a descent of man. They had iron, they had copper, they had all of that. So this account goes contradictory to the scientists, but has been scientifically validated. The second thing we see here is Lamech achieved the peak of worldly success. He's surrounded by beautiful women. He has lovely daughters. He has successful sons. He has influence over the culture and society at large because he is the father of everything that is benefiting society. A pre-flood Elon Musk in his own, <laughs> in his own mind. But then we see that even with the advancement of what we call civilization, what began with bloodshed in the flesh ends with bloodshed in the flesh. As civilized as Lamech thought himself to be, we see in verse 23 that Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, wives of Lamech. Listen to my speech, for I have killed the man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech, 70 times sevenfold. We'll, next week, we'll talk a little bit about what the inference of that 70 times seven is going to mean. But what we know from the text and how it's structured is that there was apparently an altercation with a younger man in this society, in this city, and this younger man attacked Lamech. We don't know if he deserved it. 
right? We don't know the circumstances regarding it. But this man gets wounded, and Lamech, instead of wounding him back or instead of seeking help from others, he then goes above and beyond and kills this man. Apparent self-defense. Now, and here's the other thing we're not told. We're not told the time in between the wound and him going back and killing this man. So we can't definitively say this was self-defense. At most, second-degree murder, at, at, you know, at least manslaughter. But this is a crime. He shed blood. Regardless of the circumstances uh, surrounding this, I think what the Lord is drawing to our attention is that Cain sowed blood into the earth and his whole genealogy is in rebellion to God and it ends with bloodshed. This guy seeks to even justify himself, not to the family of the person he killed, to his own family to his own wives, who he already has authority over. Why do they need convincing? This is self-justification. And by the way, think about this. He comes in and starts declaring this, whatever the circumstances are, he starts declaring it and trying to justify his killing of another man, which again, self-defense, killing, according to scripture, is not murder. But regardless, he's not having a heart of someone who had to put someone to death because he was being attacked. If you ever talk to a combat veteran, if you ever talk to someone who served in the theater of war and you ask them what war is like and and what it's like to kill another person, they most likely won't talk about it or they'll come to tears when they talk about it. It is not a glorious thing. And as many of those veterans as not only I've had in my own family, but I've spoken to the ones who truly have seen combat do not glorify it. Why is he glorifying it? Why is he saying, I'm innocent? Like O.J. Simpson trying to put the glove on. Oh, it wasn't me, right? You know what I mean? He's trying to justify himself. He doesn't plead his case before God either. God at least chased down Cain and had a face-to-face with him. God was the one who said to Cain, anyone who tries to kill you, you will be avenged sevenfold. He's declaring that for himself putting himself in the place of God, thinking he gets to dispense his own consequences. And listen, when we're caught in sin, we like to say, well, I'll just do this. I'll just go to church. I'll just, you know, stop doing this for a little while. We try to justify ourselves and even add our own consequences as opposed to going before the Lord and saying, Lord, I have messed up and whatever you have in store for me is okay. Because what did we say that quote from, um, uh, that quote from last week where it said that the, the, the key distinction of the renewed life is that the sinner takes, uh, takes sides with God against himself. That's one of the key distinctions of having, having your heart being born again is that you now say, Lord, whatever you have to do with my sin, do whatever it takes to wash it away. As opposed to say, you know what, God, I kind of messed up, but you know, I'll, I'll give you like four or five Hail Marys. You know what I mean? I'll go to church for a week and, you know, maybe I'll fast for Lent. This is what this man is doing, trying to justify himself. And though he comes to the realization that he had the same capability for bloodshed in his heart, he tries to justify it away. It hasn't left. As civilized as their city has become, as resourceful as their society has become, the issue regarding murder lies in the heart of men. So when you see someone saying, we can fix this through social change, they cannot. The murderous heart must be born again. That is the only way to fix racism. That is the only way to fix sexism. That is the only way to fix the feeling in your heart that you've been, uh, you know, born in the wrong body. You must be born again. Then you will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The heart changes first. But think about this, Tubal Cain, the last named male in Cain's genealogy means the fruit of our works. What did Cain bring before the Lord? The fruit of his works. This whole chapter is one great testimony to the fact that the wages of sin is death, that God's Righteousness is different than our self-righteousness. 
our righteousness is as filthy rags, as it says in Isaiah chapter 6. What we can attain to by the work of our flesh, by self-righteousness, by trying to justify ourselves through what we can offer the world or through worldly philosophies will always result in death. And don't think just because we have a civilized society that at a moment's notice it can't turn barbaric. It did in Cain's day and age. It did in Lamech's day and age. The fruit of Cain, the fruit of works is death. But there's another passage in Isaiah that doesn't leave our circumstance there. We'll end here, Isaiah chapter 11, or sorry, chapter one. God, seeing what the fruit of our sin would end in, he wants to reason with us regarding how we have a way out. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 11. The Lord saying to Israel, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle, I do not delight in the blood of bulls, of goats, or of lambs. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices to me. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear you, for your hands are full of blood." Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away evil things from your doing and from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat of the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. God is saying the works of your hands, if they are simple religiosity, cannot Bring favor in my sight because right now your sinful hands are stained with blood and that has to be dealt with first. If you had blood on your hands, we were already unclean to enter the temple, let alone to have blood on your hands and enter the temple and try to offer sacrifices. It would make those sacrifices unclean before the Lord. And the Lord's saying, deal with the blood. Deal with the blood that's on your hands. And he calls them out. He doesn't say, hey, let's just let bygones be bygones. I'll pass over your sin and I'm not even going to remind you. No, he said, your sins are as scarlet. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. He doesn't mince words, but he says, though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be white like snow. When God calls us to repentance of the work of our flesh, of self-righteousness, of trying to please him with our own devices, he's saying you have to acknowledge that everything you do in your own strength will amount to death. You have to acknowledge that first. That's the problem. That's the bad news, saints. The wages of sin is death. But the good news is, though they are death, though they are bloodstained, through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the same faith that Abel showed, believing that it was the shedding of blood that can redeem his sins, through that same faith, you can be washed clean. And just like God said to Cain, if you do the same, will you not be justified? Will you not be accepted? Saints, if we come with the faith of Abel, we will be made clean, but if we live according to the way of Cain, it will breed death in our lives. I urge of you to put death to death, put flesh to death, put sin to death. Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Amen. Amen. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it corrects us, Lord. How foolish it is to walk in our own strength when we have access to the one who is strong beyond all measure. So Father, if 
there are people who are walking in rebellion in their heart. May they not flee from your presence. May they not flee from the light of your conviction. Lord, even me, if there's any wicked way in my heart, search it and know it. Purge us with hyssop, Lord. Scrub out the corners of our hearts so that you can then wash us clean and replace what was once there in death with new life. So, Father, bless your saints. Teach us all to put the deeds of the flesh to death. And we thank you for the new life in faith through grace that was bestowed upon us in the blood of Jesus Christ. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.